welcome to the Joseph Goldstein Insight Hour. This podcast is an expression of our shared interest in self-discovery. Join Joseph as he shares his deep knowledge of the path of mindfulness. If you are interested in supporting this podcast, please go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Joseph. There are a few more instructions to come, specific instructions about particular aspects of our experience. This morning, I thought just to do a review of what we've offered so far, just as a chance to integrate the many instructions you've already heard and chance to practice them more fully today. Wow. Because there's a lot. You know, there are a lot of different aspects that we want to become aware of. And it takes time to uh, integrate all these various instructions into what seems like a unified, simple practice. Of course, the most simple, unified instruction is be aware of what, be aware of what's arising and don't cling. That's it. That is really the whole practice. <laughs> but we have to stretch it out over a week, so. <laughs> it is good to remember, though, how simple it is. You know, and so whenever you're really feeling confused and hearing about all these different uh, things to pay attention to, uh, <laughs> In the end, it will all become very clear, but if in the process, you know, sometimes you're sitting or walking and wondering, well, what should I be doing? You can come back to this simplicity. Be aware of what's arising in the moment and don't cling to it. So I think that's just a good bottom line reference point for your practice. <clears throat> but I'll go over a little bit the various instructions that have already been given. <clears throat> The first is just settling into uh, a good sitting posture, which means um, being straight and erect, but without stiff, without tension. Uh, Sokni Rinpoche, a Tibetan teacher, uh, he uses one word which uh, really resonated with me. He said, to sit in a dignified manner. You know, so it's a very posture is offering some kind of respect for the practice. And for each one of us, that dignified posture will be different, you know, because we have to adjust to our various bodily uh, needs. But internally, we should really be taking our Dharma seat with a quality of awareness, with a quality of presence, with a quality of intentionality to be mindful I think it's important just to lay that foundation at the beginning of each sitting. We come into the hall, hopefully mindfully with each step, and sit down mindfully and take the seat mindfully. You know, sometimes when I see the Buddha image at the front of the hall or in my home and the way I relate to it sometimes is just as a, as a visual reminder of uh, what it might be like to be in the Buddha's presence. You know, so I imagine, you know, it's just, okay, this is the Buddha sitting there. How would I be if I was sitting in front of the Buddha? You know, I think we would probably all sit down with that sense of presence and dignity uh, and awareness. So taking a seat and then sitting in whatever way you do with respect to whether the eyes are open or closed. And it's really equal. In this particular tradition, we generally sit with our eyes closed. Uh, In other Buddhist traditions, sit with the eyes open. I've done both. And each one offers its own particular perspective, a slant. You can either experiment or just continue in the way that's been most comfortable for you. 
taking one seat. Let the eyes settle, either closed or just slightly open. And starting with that awareness of the presence of the body sitting. Perhaps using that phrase, there is a body. So simple. Just be aware there is a body. And within that framework of the whole body, simply become aware of whatever presents itself, whatever appears within that framework. The body breathing, the sensations of the body breathing will appear in that framework. Be connected to that dial of intentionality with respect to how carefully attentive we'll be with each single breath. With the intention being to keep the mind as steady as possible for the duration of that one breath. We really feel it in a very steady, open, soft way. The out-breath. Remembering, let the breath follow its own natural rhythm. There's no one way the breath should be. We're simply steadying our attention on each breath as it presents itself. Short, long, slow, fast, smooth, agitated, doesn't matter. We're just aware. Staying connected with there is a body. often a help in allowing the breath to find its natural rhythm. Within the framework, there is a body. Simply be aware of where in the body you feel each breath. Is it the sensations of the nostril or the movement of the chest or the abdomen? And sometimes we decide on a particular place in the body to feel the breath where it's most clear. And at other times you might simply settle back and feel each breath wherever it appears. And it may be different from breath to breath. Remembering that this is not a breathing exercise simply using this very natural process as a vehicle for training awareness. Steadiness of awareness.
within the framework, there is a body. You may also become aware of other bodily sensations beside those of breathing. If any of these sensations are calling the attention, become predominant, they become the main object of attention for those moments. Some sensations may be pleasant, some unpleasant. We're just aware. Vibration, heat, cold, pressure, tingling, tightness, heaviness, whatever it may be. We're just aware. Keep the mind alert for the arising of any thoughts or images in the mind. And notice where in that process you do become mindful. Is it after the thought or image is already passed and you remember? Is it right in the middle of the thought? Do you sometimes have the experience of awareness just as a thought begins? So simply to notice that, not judge it. You begin to notice particularly repetitive patterns of thought. You might make a very specific note, mental note, of what that pattern is. Planning, judging, commenting, remembering. And if you find that one particular pattern of thought is particularly seductive, you notice that you get caught up in that particular uh, pattern over and over again. You might set the intention at the beginning of the sitting to keep the mind particularly alert for the arising of that pattern. Because it's easiest to stay unentangled the closer to the beginning of the thought we become aware of it. And from time to time, if your mind has this inclination or interest. When there are different thoughts happening in the mind, we ask the question, what is a thought? And on that level, we're not interested so much in the content but in the very nature of thought as a phenomenon. And the point of asking the question, what is a thought, is not so much to get some conceptual answer, 
but simply as a way of reminding ourselves to look deeply into the nature of thought. It's to remind ourselves to look. Perhaps seeing how empty and ephemeral, ephemeral thoughts are. And at different times, some strong emotion or particular mind state will arise and really be the predominant aspect of our experience. We want to bring mindfulness and awareness to the experience of those emotions and mind states. Sometimes they're pleasant, sometimes they're unpleasant. Might be fear or anger or love, or compassion, or interest, or boredom. There's a wide range of emotions that may arise, a wide range of mind states. We can include them all in our practice. It can be very helpful to use the mental noting at times with different emotions. It's the very act of that soft mental note can help us disengage from identification with the emotions. We feel them fully. We're open to the whole experience of them in the mind, in the body, in the heart. We can learn to experience them fully without claiming them to be I and mine. They're arising out of conditions, just like clouds appear in the sky. The conditions change, the emotions change. If an emotion or mind state is particularly strong, it's helpful to remember that our experience of emotions or different mind states is often a complex experience with many components. There may be certain patterns of thought involved in an emotion. There may be certain sensations in the body associated with different emotions. There's the particular flavor of that emotion in the mind, in the heart. And so when that is the predominant aspect of our experience, can be helpful to investigate in a careful way what is this experience that I'm calling sadness? What is this experience that I'm calling joy or fear or anger or love, whatever it may be? So we don't settle for a superficial recognition, but we're really exploring 
with care how we're actually experiencing it in the mind and body. And the key to this practice is really having interest in what's arising. It's not to try to make things a certain way. It's not to try to have certain kinds of experiences rather than others. It's learning how to be aware of what's arising and not clinging. That's always the reference point for our practice. Notice when the mind slips into the more or less mindfulness space. If you notice that, that you're kind of present, but also thinking along at the same time, Trains of thought. Just very gently turn that intentionality dial up just a slight a bit. connect more completely and fully either with the breath or sensations or any other object that's arising.
Do you have any questions about your practice or the instructions? I've been struggling a lot with thoughts and tried now uh, just to go straight to the thoughts and think intentionally. And it felt much easier. And then the breath and the body became distractions and, you know, coming back to the thoughts. And uh, it, seemed, it seems like a risky. <laughs> yeah. Could you hear the question in the back? Okay, so it was about whether uh, it's possible to make thoughts the primary object of attention because he was having a lot of thoughts uh, and I guess being carried away by a lot and then thought, well, what if I just intentionally pay attention to thought as the main object and even to intentionally think? Did it, was that part of it? Uh, it's half Okay. <laughs> It is very interesting to make, to take some time to make thought as the main focus of attention. And I'll suggest a little thought game, uh, that I've worked with a lot and I found really helpful. The one part that uh, I might leave out a little bit is, uh, the, the intentionally thinking because enough thoughts come by themselves. You don't have to generate them, you know, in- intentionally, but the thought game, it can be really interesting. So it's sitting back and imagining, you, imagining yourself sitting like in a movie theater, you know, and you're just watching the screen of the mind. And your intention for that period of time, and it could be a whole sitting, it could be part of a sitting, you could just play. The intention is you're just watching the screen of the mind and you're simply waiting for thoughts to appear. And because that's all you're doing, you, you're not, particularly with the breath or sensations or anything else, your main focus is just watching the screen of the mind. And before too long, some thought is going to come. Because you're just waiting for them, generally it's quite a bit easier to pick them up just just as they arise rather than after they're already over. So it it lends a kind of alertness with respect to arising thoughts. Then it's very interesting just to observe some thoughts will be loud and clear and very obvious in the screen. Some may be a little softer. Some may be like whispers in the mind. So just notice all the different ways that thoughts manifest, you know. Uh, And then it gets a little tricky because we'll be watching the screen of the mind, becoming aware of thoughts just as they appear. And then there'll be a little kind of voice from behind. Oh, doing pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> so we need a 360 degree screen because that's just another thought. Right? And so we don't want to back into that becoming who we are. Oh, I'm doing pretty good. But to see it is just another thought arising, but they're sneaky. You know, so we have to really, <laughs> that 360 degree view. Um, yeah, and, and to do just that for, you know, some period of time, however, or as long as you're interested or you're really maintaining that quality of attentive, it's very, it can be very helpful because it's a way of training the mind to be alert and aware for the arising of thoughts, which, as we all know, because they just slip in, they slip in so often unnoticed, uh, very different than a sensation or a sound, you know, even a strong emotion, which is very obviously present. Thoughts just uh, kind of slide in. We hardly even know they're there till they carry us away. So this really focuses our attention on them. Uh, and in doing that, I think you'll see how ephemeral these thoughts are because we're just sitting, watching the screen of the mind, thoughts are appearing. And because we're attentive in that way, uh, I think you'll find that they, they get very little purchase. You know, they, they don't have time to really root themselves. Uh, so it's very, it's a very, uh, 
good doorway to insight into the empty nature of thought. So I, th- I think that could be a really good idea. <laughs> so the question was, she, 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 when she's sitting, she experiences a lot of pain, shoulder blade pain after about 30 minutes or so. And experimenting with different postures, she found that if she does lying meditation in, the, in her room, uh, the sitting actually, the, con- the concentration is good, the mindfulness is good, the body is relaxed, eyes open, very alert. But it feels like cheating. Uh, it's definitely not cheating. The only measure... More or less mindfulness is cheating. <laughs> if you want to use that. <laughs> because we can be fully present and mindful in any posture. So the obvious danger of meditating in lying position would be the tendency to fall asleep. But if you're not finding that, and you're finding the mind is really alert and even more alert because you're relaxed, I think it's totally fine. And I've done a lot of lying meditation at different times of you know, real back stuff or whatever. There's just story, a story that my first teacher, Manindraji, told 10,000 times. <laughs> 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 so if you've heard the same story, you know, you old yogis, <laughs> this is nothing. <laughs> so this is the story of Ananda, who was the Buddha's attendant. Um... And after the Buddha's death, he had just realized, by the time of the Buddha's death, he had just realized the first stage of enlightenment. You know, and all his buddies had become fully enlightened. Uh, and they were having this big council meeting some, sometime after the Buddha's death to kind of rehearse the teachings and, uh, you know, recite the teachings. And Ananda's Arhan friend said, you know, tomorrow's a big meeting. Get it together. <laughs> You know, you're just a stream enterer. This, come on, up the game a little bit. So he got really inspired and all, he spent all night walking, just walking back and forth, walking meditation. But it was getting close to the morning and the time of the meeting and, you know, nothing was going on. But Ananda had heard a lot of teachings, was himself very wise. And as he examined his practice, he realized he was making way too much effort. You know, and that's what was keeping his mind out of balance, that kind of striving or ambition or craving, you know, for realization. So he decided to lie down, you know, to do lying meditation just as a way of balancing everything. And as the story goes, you know, he went to his room, started lying down, and in the process of going from standing to lying, and it said, before his head hit the pillow, and his feet were on the bed, you know, just in that intermediate posture, he became fully enlightened with all the powers. And again, the story, he appeared magically, you know, spontaneously in the, in the community of the meeting, uh, demonstrating his attainment. <laughs> so this is to say, full enlightenment can come in any moment, in any posture. You know, we, we shouldn't think, oh, I have to be in a certain posture for the practice, the depth of the practice to be realized. It has to do with the quality of our attention. Uh, so the next time you go to lie down, just remember that's, that that could be your moment. <laughs> All the way in the back. It is a little more complicated out in the world, and I think different situations would call for different approaches to not clinging. So it's hard to give a general answer for all of life's situations, because each one, you know, where we're attached has a particular hook. And so we would really have to see, okay, what's the hook in this particular situation? Um but I'll just give you, in a way, it's a trivial example, but maybe you could extrapolate from it, you know, and see how it might apply in at least some of the situations you're in. So sometimes when I'm just, you know, hanging out with friends, maybe going out for dinner, and, you know, some friends will say, you know, where do you want to go? 
which restaurant do you want to go to? And because it's so in my mind that five minutes after the meal is done, it won't have made the slightest bit of difference. (laughs) And so wherever you'd like to go is fine with me. (laughs) And that, that attitude of just really comes from the understanding of the impermanence of this thing, which before it happens seems so important. And a few minutes after the fact, there's just nothing. I'll give you another example. <laughs> when I was in India in the early days, uh, I just decided to shave my head. Of course, these days I don't need to, but <laughs> back then. And it just was this huge thing in my mind. You know, it was the first time I had done it. And I was just, it just felt like a huge thing you know, to, to shave my head. But I, I went ahead and did it. And it was the same thing. It's like, I don't know, 30 seconds after it was done, it didn't make any difference at all. There was no... It was completely unimportant. <laughs> yeah. And again, it's just that awareness of the change, and it's okay, and so we don't have to hold on so tightly. So... The, As I said, it's kind of a generic sense of applying the wisdom and permanence to different life situations. There may be more complicated situations that we find ourselves in that would take a little more uh, analysis of exactly what we're holding on to and whether it's really serving us. And the holding on or the attachment is always extra because we can do what we think is the right thing to do in a particular situation, but what's the quality of our mind with which we're doing it? Are we, are we really attached to the outcome? You know, in which case there'll be a lot of, or often a lot of struggle. Or do we see, you know, this feels like the right path, but with a more open sense of the mind without attachment to the outcome, and so that, in my experience, just leads to a lot more uh, flexibility and creativity uh, in different situations. But as I say, each, each situation w- might require its own careful seeing, okay, where am I getting hooked here? Where am I getting attached? Uh, I just want to say a few words uh, about the walking meditation. Uh, and there's an Just one further instruction that if you wanted to play with, uh, I found really helpful at a particular time in my practice. So as I hope you realize, we can do the walking practice at any speed. It's it's not about speed, it's about mindfulness. And so sometimes we're walking more quickly, sometimes more slowly. So in in the more quick pace, using the frame, there is a body, and then walking and just seeing what's being felt as we're moving at that pace, you know, where we're not zeroing in on a particular part of the body, but there is a body. And then we walk and just see what's being known moment after moment. So it's kind of an open awareness. As we slow down the pace, we might want to really direct the mind to a specific part or parts of the body, like the feeling the feet or the legs, in the course of taking a step. So there we're getting a little more microscopic in terms of the sensations that are being felt in the lifting, in the moving, in the placing. And the mind can get really concentrated in doing this. There's a third uh, step. If you want to practice going really slowly, uh, Saito Pandita at one point suggested dividing the step into six parts. And so it's just lifting and then dividing the forward movement into two. And you could use whatever words. It's lifting, and you, you might say moving, swinging, or whatever word comes to you. So it's lifting and then moving the first half and swinging and then lowering start to come down, placing, 
as you first touch the ground and then stepping where all the weight goes on. So those are the six. And again, the word, whatever words you use is, are fine. So it's lifting, moving, swinging, lowering, placing, stepping. When I did this, it really changed the quality of my attention in the walking. Because even in the rather slow walking of lifting, moving, placing, what I found, and you'll see whether this resonates with your own experience, but I found even when I was doing the slow walking, there was often a slight leaning into the next phase of the step. It was like lifting, moving, placing. <laughs> yeah, it's like, there was a there was a kind of forward momentum, you know, that that was a certain leaning into the next part of it. When I did the six part walking, it completely cut out that leaning, and there was a different experience of being totally settled back into just this, right? just the lifting. Not lifting in order to move forward. <laughs> lifting and then moving, swinging, lowering, placing, stepping. So each part got a full, relaxed attention. And it really changed. It changed the quality, you know, of the walking and the understanding of, of what a full attention in just this moment is like without that forward lean into the next moment. I don't know the reason why, but it worked. <laughs> uh, so again, doing this at different times in your practice, maybe you feel, okay, I'm going to try this and see. Maybe at a certain time in your practice, it's not the right move for you, but you can see. You can just explore and experiment. Uh, I think it would be worth trying out and seeing if it's helpful for periods of time. And you could either you could do a whole walking period like that, or you could do ten or fifteen minutes of walking like that. So be creative and just see what really is helpful for you. Okay. What's the mantra? Have fun. <laughs> <laughs>